Once upon a time, a long time ago, it all began in a garden. That's the story of the Bible. It's not a literal story, but it's a powerful and true story. Nonetheless, it's the story of the beginning of humanity, God creating Adam and Eve. Adam, son of the red earth, created from the dust of the ground. Eve, the living one, the source of life. The Garden of Eden was where they were placed, also called the Garden of God, a garden filled with immense potential. And in it were two trees. First was the tree of life. And eating from this tree of life connected people to God's own life to God's own potential. This tree was full of power to live out the kind of life that God envisioned for all of creation. In the garden, there was also another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the story, God says to these first human beings, don't eat from that tree. Ah, but it's so tempting. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about self, about ego, about what is good for me, about what I want, what I need, regardless of the impact it has on others. To eat from this tree pits people against each other in a continual battle for power and supremacy. Eating from this tree means seizing life for ourselves on our own terms, apart from God's wisdom and God's care for all of humanity. The first humans eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the story takes a turn. Adam and Eve are exiled from the life that is abundant all around. And they enter into a life of death, of pain, of suffering, of hardship, when they mistreat each other. The biblical story has a very clear bias from beginning to end. To eat of the tree of life, that tree that connects people to God's own life, to God's unlimited love and power, is to transform and recreate the world towards what is best for humankind. Not only is it best for humankind, but the bias of the Bible, indeed the promise of the Bible, is that that kind of life will prevail. Those are the promises of God. The promises of the steadfast love of God that we celebrate in baptism again today. To eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, however, seems sometimes far more prevalent in our age and throughout all ages. Powerful political figures around the world, historically and today, constantly pit each other, people against each other, in war, they see the other as less than human, as despicable, as animals that need to be extinguished or put down. Powerful people have an interest in maintaining the status quo and in making sure that that status quo actually increases in terms of protecting the wealth of the 1% as opposed to the struggle of the lowest 50%. And to do so, powerful figures love to play the blame game. Blame all of our problems on immigrants. Blame all of society's ills and struggles on indigenous people. Blame those on social assistance. It appears, historically and today as well, 
that from time to time there is a great loss of kindness, compassion, and care. And often it is based on economic interests. It costs too much to truly give people the kind of care that they need. It costs too much to feed the world, to house the world, to give the world what the world actually needs. This in a world where there is an increasing divide between the rich and the poor, with those who are poor fighting over less and less resources all the time, and those who are rich, the 1% we call them, are grotesquely rich. As a society, we have been eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if we are honest with ourselves, sometimes as individuals we do the same. What does all of this have to do with our passage this morning that Gladys read and Jesus' promise of eternal life? In verse 54, Gladys read, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. What's the first thing that you think of when you hear that passage? When you hear the word eternal life in churches, especially in our Western church, what's the first thing that you think of? There was a woman who was diagnosed with a terminal illness and only given three months to live. She asked for her minister to come to her home to discuss her final wishes, and she told him what song she wanted sung at her funeral, what scriptures to read, and which outfit she wanted to be buried in. And then she said, one more thing. I want to be buried with a fork in my hand. The pastor was surprised. The woman explained, in all of my years attending church, church socials and potluck dinners, I always remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, someone would inevitably say, keep your fork, because the best is yet to come. And I knew that something far better was coming, uh, chocolate, velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie, something absolutely wonderful. So I want people to see me there in my casket with my fork in hand and wonder, what's with the fork? Then I want you to tell them, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. Is that our understanding of eternal life, that the best is yet to come. Now, I, I don't want to take away any comfort that you derive from the concept of eternal life that way. Certainly, Jesus has all kinds of promises about resurrection that we go to be with God forever. I don't want to take any of that away from you. Actually, Jesus said it in this passage as well. He said, on the last day, I will raise them up. But that's not what the term eternal life means. Take a closer look at verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. So often we just read that verse as if it were one and the same thing. We forget the and in the middle. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. That's how we read it, as if it's all the same thing. But they're not the same thing. When we focus our Christian faith just on what happens after we die, we turn our faith into a cosmic insurance policy. Pay the premiums now, go to church, believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, keep your nose clean, and you'll get your ticket to heaven. 
I used to say that that was a caricature of our Christian faith. Today, I'm more inclined to call it the greatest heresy that the church has faced. And the Western church is most guilty of it. When we reduce our faith to what happens after we die, to Jesus raising us up on the last day, when our focus is making sure that we get to heaven, when we teach others that the tenets of our faith are such that if we don't believe them, we'll go to hell instead of heaven, when we do these things, we continually slap Jesus in the face time and time again. Jesus is not our ticket to heaven. Jesus is not our eternal life insurance policy. Jesus is not our personal Lord and Savior apart from community, the world in which we live. Faith is not about me, 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 and what happens after I die. The Christian faith is not about eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No. Let's get back to verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That phrase in Hebrew, eternal life or everlasting life, literally means life unto the age. And what does that mean? That phrase takes the readers of John's gospel, and they knew it back then. It takes them back to the creation story. Life unto the age, eternal life, is the new and deeper kind of life. The kind of life that comes from eating of the tree of life. That tree that connects us to God, to God's own life. It's the age of life and of love. God's promise, even though humankind so often rejects God's life, God's age, God's vision, God's wisdom, God's promise is that God will lead us the way back, the way back to the age of life, to eternal life, lived out here and now. Jesus picks up that promise, this promise of, of God leading the way back. Jesus is God's own life become human. And for us as Christians, Jesus leads us back. In John's Gospel, in another chapter, John says it this way, this is eternal life that people may know you, the one eternal God, and Jesus Christ who has been sent. Eternal life, that phrase, has nothing to do with life after death. Jesus covers that differently. Eternal life has to do with leaning into God here and now, eating of the tree of life that gives us peace and helps us to recognize each other as fellow human beings and stops us from pitting one against the other for our own needs and for our own well-being. Again, this, this way of seeing life and of seeing God and of inviting God into our lives by eating of the tree of life every day that was rejected they put Jesus to death but God's life is more powerful than death and God's love is more powerful than anything Jesus rises from the dead and can offer God's life here and now Whoever trusts in Jesus, the scriptures say, will not perish, but have eternal life. That is to say that when we follow, when we lean into, when we have faith in Christ, we are recreated here and now to share in God's age 
of life, a world where the age of death no longer has any power, life that is fully connected to God's own eternal life, and a love is a life that will never end. Over the last 40 years of being a minister, I've witnessed the Western church particularly capitulate to the power of the age of death. It's just too hard to resist. You know, it, it's too hard for preachers to consistently call their parishioners to account and to call themselves as preachers to account when they are dependent on those very same preachers for their paycheck. It's just too hard. And so ministers and the church, we capitulate. And we turn the gospel of Jesus Christ with its powerful capacity to transform life here and now into something that it's easier to hold on to. Just believe in Jesus. Just keep your nose clean. Just do the right things. And you'll get eternal life. That is to say, you'll go to heaven. We capitulate. And the Western church has capitulated. But Jesus' call and God's promise continue to survive even when the church has capitulated. Hold on to your fork, Jesus might say to us today. Hold on to your fork and dig in right now. For we have work to do. We have a world to feed, a society to transform, and all of the power and the immense potential that is found in the tree of life is available to us here and now. Because God is not way out there somewhere. God is present. And God gives us this power as sure as God is present in water through baptism. Thanks be to God. Amen.